mistake I did. Uh, first of all, this is Joy Ford with uh, Jennifer Kuhn and two colleagues from the University of Massachusetts, uh, Anna and Tillman. This grew out of uh, work that we did on our uh, on an NSF grant on um, uh, it's over now. Uh, and um, I gave a shorter version of this talk at ICTCS last summer. And it was it's an invited paper for a blue sky track. So there's not going to be any results. Uh, so this is kind of high level, but there will be a little bit of concurrent aspect. So, what are we trying to do? So the, the high level goal here is to generalize the money flow in the internet. Okay? So it's about as that's about as disruptive a goal as, as probably you can come up with. Okay? But uh, and I'll I'll give a little bit of background about that, but for the purposes of this talk, what we're thinking about is what, what might that look like? What's what's the status quo today? And what might it look like if we were able to change that? Now, why do we want to do that? Well, the hypothesis is that the current money flow uh, in the internet uh, is very static and discourages competition. Okay? Most uh, users have at most two choices, if they even have two choices of internet service provider. Um, and so, when there's competition, then the hypothesis is that there's more innovation. Uh, we still have the same basic service that was designed about 40 years ago uh, in the internet, and it was an experiment that got out of hand. So, anyway, we're going to try to have some economic incentives for innovation. So, quick tutorial on how the internet is structured today. Uh, it is made up of interconnected provider networks, I'm going to refer to provider networks uh, throughout the talk, and the technical name for these provider networks is autonomous systems, okay, or AS. And right now, there are somewhere between 60,000, uh-oh, hit the cable, that was a bad idea. Somewhere between 60,000 and 100,000 autonomous systems. So uh, each one of these things has a number. There's somewhere between 60 and 100,000. Last year, the Registry for North America gave out uh, 1,400 AS numbers. So this number is going up all the time. That's the reason I don't know what the number is. When you send something, when you use the internet, your packets typically go through multiple provider networks, right? So. Um, Nobody controls the whole internet. Google is trying to. Uh, others may be working out towards that too. But generally, your packets are going to cross the network of one or more providers, right? And a provider, these clouds represent a bunch of routers and a bunch of channels that are connected to each other to get your bits from one place to the other, right? And I'm using the clouds, and the black lines are represent the channels that interconnect these service providers. So. You know, the cloud would be like AT&T or Verizon or Spectrum or Comcast or, you know, smaller ones like uh, QX.net here in Lexington and some of those, okay? So they have some infrastructure and uh, they talk to each other. So packets have to get from one provider network to the next, usually to get uh, to where they need to go. And there's a protocol called BGP, the Border Gateway Protocol, that defines uh, how these networks talk to each other. And 
particular, the border gateway protocol is the way uh, a network, say qx.net, finds out where it should send packets to get to some destination, right? So Google or Amazon or Netflix, um, and I'll talk a little bit more about how that works a little later. So uh, BGP is the routing part of that, so every, every network, every uh, provider will advertise the destinations that are reachable through their network. Right? Everybody that's connecting, I'm not showing the edges, I'll show it in the next, uh, the next slide. So, uh, we classify these provider networks for the purposes of this talk into access and transit. Okay? So access networks are the yellow ones, <clears throat> they're the ones that we connect to around the edge. Right? So Spectrum, your cable provider, your wireless, cell service provider, that's an access network, right? Um, transit networks, represented by the gray clouds, connect access networks to each other, okay? So this is a different kind of service. So this is a simplified model in that we're gonna say every network is either an access network uh, or a transit network, and in reality, some are both. So like AT&T is both an access provider and they have a big transit network. The transit networks generally have kind of global span, right? So they can get you from one continent to another or across the country, whereas access networks often are sort of local in scope, okay? Bigger than a campus, but not as big as a, as a continent. Um, this is also simplified because access networks are often classified according to whether they mostly connect to what's colloquial, colloquially called eyeballs or content. Okay, so in my figure, I've got cell phones and laptops and home, home uh, subscribers, and then those other boxes represent data centers, right? So that would be like Netflix would be a content network, right? A lot of the content providers have their own uh, networks that connect to the rest of the internet. Uh, some access providers might have both, uh, both content and eyeball, eyeballs, but we're going to abstract from that difference for the purposes of this talk. Okay, so the current economic structure. So uh, obviously these providers, these networks have an investment infrastructure, right? It costs money to deploy these routers and run these fibers and things like that. So they need to make money somehow. They need to be compensated for carrying the packets, right? Uh, that's true for the access providers. It's also true for the transit providers. So there's this compensation principle that says if I'm going to carry, if I'm a provider, I'm going to carry packets for somebody, I need to get some kind of compensation for that, right? Well, your packets, unfortunately, don't have tickets when they go through the network, they're just carried, right? So, um, so when packets go from, uh, let's say, your house to, let's say, Netflix, right? Um, they probably go through a transit network, and if you do, if you run trace route from your laptop, I was going to do the to run it and show you this. Uh, it didn't work yesterday when I wanted to show it, but um, you'll probably find that your packets are going through some transit network, like level three or something like that, <coughs> depending on where you're going. So the problem is that compensation, the internet, like I said, was a research uh, experiment that escaped from the lab and became this thing that's now critical infrastructure. Okay? It wasn't ever really designed to be a commercial enterprise. And so um, Dave Clark tells this story about uh, talking to an economist about the internet ecosystem, and the economist says, you guys screwed up the money protocols. And Dave Clark says, we didn't, desi we didn't design any money protocols. And the economist says, that's what I said. <laughs> okay, so, uh, 
The way this works is these networks have what are called peering agreements. Okay, and these are things that lawyers go into a room for a couple of days and come out and, and there's a contract. And they, it, it describes the service that one network is going to provide. So if it's an access network and a transit network, then the access network is going to pay the transit network to carry its packets, right? Because where does money enter the system in this picture? <coughs> Where's the money come from that runs the internet? Eyeballs. What? Eyeballs. Comes from eyeballs, mostly. Okay? In general, it comes from the edge, right? The access networks are the only place where money enters the system. Okay? So the money sort of flows up in the hierarchy from the access networks to the transit networks. And those are contracts, those peering agreements, um, describe how much traffic is going to be carried and uh, they are very, very slow changing. It's a very heavyweight transaction, okay? Now, some access networks might have a, have a connection between them, like these do, and if they both feel like they're each getting sort of the same level of service, then they might have an agreement where there's no money changing hands. Right? But if an access network needs to go through a transit network to get to the rest of the to the rest of the internet, then there's going to be money going through there. Okay, so basic problem, those things, that that money flow is very slow to change. There were no money protocols in the original internet architecture, so simplicity was the governing principle for setting up the money flows. Okay? <laughs> what we're trying to do, what we'd like to do, is, is generalize that. And that's where the idea of a spot market for interdomain connectivity comes in. Okay? So we're going to take a little subgraph of that example that I had, where transit provider X, we're transit provider X, and we connect to these other five networks, three of which A, B, and C are access networks, and D and E are other transit networks. Okay, and so we provide connectivity among those. Um, and provider X can measure the traffic coming in and out. It sort of knows the traffic load at each, on each one of these ports, right? So uh, this is an example that I just made up. It's a traffic matrix that shows traffic going from one network to another network. Uh, at some particular hour, let's say Wednesday at noon, and uh, this is the 90th percentile load measured over time in gigabits per second. I don't know, it could be, could be anything, okay? So the idea is um, X knows what this looks like and knows how it varies over time, and probably all of these links are, you know, at least 10 gigabits per second or something, and some of them obviously are way more than that, they're probably 40 or 100 gigabits capacity. <clears throat> but uh, the transit providers have to engineer their networks for the busy hour load, right? And presumably Wednesday noon is, let's say it's not the busy hour, okay? It could be, but let's say it's not. So networks probably at times have unused capacity, right? And the whole idea of this, the is that maybe they could um, sell, if they could sell this unused capacity dynamically, then everybody would win, okay? Uh, now there's certain conditions and I'll, and I'll talk about those, but for example, okay, between C and A, X provides transit between C and A, uh, and at this particular hour, there's sort of a low level of traffic there compared to compared to other things. So uh, X might say uh, to CNA, hey, I can sell you some additional traffic, some additional capacity, right? Well, the offered load isn't there, so why would C or A want to buy this, right? Where's the demand going to come from? Well, the, the demand comes from uh, what we might call elastic traffic, traffic um, which is traffic 
that doesn't need a particular quality of service. It doesn't need to go right now. It could be moved around in time. So the canonical example would be backups, right? So if there's a company that has a data center in, that connects to access provider A and a data center that connects to access provider C, and they want to move traffic between those data centers, they could probably do that any time. And uh, X might say, hey, if you want to do this at Wednesday at noon, I've got capacity and I can sell that to you. And I can sell it to you cheaper than it would cost you to do it according to our regular contract, right? So the idea here is that everybody wins because the, the customers that are buying this on this spot market can get tra transit service cheaper than they would normally get it. Um, and the, the transit provider gets additional revenue that it wouldn't otherwise get. Now, there's another example in, the, in this matrix where um, C and, between C and D, okay, D is a transit provider, right? And X is selling C transit service, but there's not much going between these two ports at this particular hour, and it might be because D actually has another connection to C. This is not the complete graph. So C might actually also be buying uh, transit from D on a contract basis. That's called a multi-homed access network. But uh, X might be able to say, look, uh, I can give you cheaper transit to that, to, to whatever D is giving you uh, connection to. So, okay, so that's the uh, basic idea. There was prior work by uh, a guy named Bao Chun Li at uh, University of Toronto and his student who did an economic analysis of this and under certain reasonable assumptions uh, they looked at how you could price this and, and they assumed uh, a demand curve, right? Um, but they showed that everybody could win by, by selling this uh, short-term access to the, to the excess capacity. So, all of that was set up to say, what we want to look at is, uh, what would it take to realize such a spot market? Okay, what does it take technically? Well, the transit providers need some way of uh, measuring and predicting their capacity, like the, the traffic matrix example that I just showed you. Uh, they need some way of setting the price, deciding what, it, what they can get for that Capacity, which probably they would have to develop over time. Uh, they need some way of, of distinguishing this revenue generating traffic from other traffic. Uh, and, and one way they might do that is by using software defined networking, uh, which is uh, a way of setting up paths through the network for specific classes of traffic. And I'm not going to go into details about that. Um, but that is the way that we sort of postulate that they could do this. The access providers need some way of measuring the demand or knowing that this elastic demand is there. And then there's, everybody needs some way of doing this transaction, right? Including uh, setting up the routing to get through end to end all the way through the network. Uh, yes? Uh, I, I want to go one step back. Uh, so I understand the speaking of selling per capacity, but uh, somehow in your motivation, uh, I didn't get a sense that this capacity is needed, that there is indeed somewhere a huge block which is uh, blocks the traffic, people may lose money. Right. You're saying everybody wins, but uh, if, if only service providers make money, they win. But Right, so that's the, <clears throat> that's why I was talking about the elastic traffic, right? So if there are, uh, let's say, backup traffic that somebody needs, there, there needs to be a demand, yes. The assumption is that there is some demand, okay? Um, and, and that is an assumption. Uh, but I would say it's a critical assumption because only when you understand uh, the nature of the problem, where the shortages come from, how they demonstrate themselves, 
only then I think you can start to develop solutions. Right. So there is work that shows that there is uh, that some of these inter-domain connections are congested, and that actually sometimes this is used uh, in ways that in, in sort of non-organic ways, like it's used as a weapon, like one provider will not upgrade the capacity of the channel because they're trying they're unhappy with the person with the provider on the other side of the link. So there's all kinds of, of subtleties about that, but your basic point is is absolutely on target. There there needs to be this demand. Um, I'll say this later, but once the mechanism is in place to do this dynamic transaction, then that opens up a lot of other possibilities, including, okay, if I know that I have access to, to, to this market, this spot market, I may not, I may negotiate a lower contract rate on my, on my fundamental service. So I should have said that the spot market would, would not replace this, it would operate alongside the, the fundamental contract service. But, um, once it's in place, then you can imagine it would have an effect on the way these contracts are set up. Okay, Victor? Well, there is actually an assumption here, which is that if they are connected, that one of the, that's not, one of the nodes, or both nodes, can pay each other. Can pay each other. That's an economic assumption. It's not that good. Well, it's a contract, so whenever there's a contract, there's that kind of assumption of exchange of value. Right? But of course, we can easily imagine that, that if you don't like island up now, okay, you will not, even though you have a connection, you are selling the motion and you use this as a subject for the economy. Sorry, say, say that again. Well, what I'm saying is that maybe, maybe you know, you are connected to the island now in Pacific. But for political reasons, then you will not allow to accept whatever they are willing to pay you, okay? whichever money you need. Or you just if you want to slow it down. It seems to me that, that there are hidden assumptions here, and they are dynamic. You know? right. Somebody but, may decide that you don't want to be So, so there are two, but, um, there's contracts. Right. Currently, there are, the, the way it currently works is there are contracts, and there are court systems to settle disputes about contracts. Right. So all of that is outside of that. That's where all of that happens. Okay. And yes, such disputes could arise in this context also. But so there would need to be some kind of contractual understanding of uh, of, of what's going on with these transactions. So I need to, in my last four minutes now, uh, introduce. Uh, Another piece, modifying the, the, the diagram a little bit, because this is uh, the sort of vehicle we envision for making this happen, okay? Uh, and this is where the sort of current, keeping current aspect comes in, because over time, in the last 10 years or so, uh, this notion of an internet exchange point has been introduced. And what it is, is we, we change the picture here, instead of these networks connecting directly to each other, they connect to one of these internet exchange points, okay? And the basic idea there is, uh, it's kind of like a switch, and instead of having, if I have these three networks, instead of having three, each one of them having two connections, they only have to have one connection, and this internet exchange point will move the traffic between whoever it needs to. So once, if I'm a provider, once I connect to the IXP, uh, then it's a simple matter, it's a software programming matter, essentially, for me to get a connection to anybody else that's connected to the same IXP, okay? And uh, this is a phenomenon that's kind of developed in, in fairly recent years. Uh, mostly, in, it started out in Europe, I think, more than anywhere, but now it's, it's, it, it's catching on, and these things are also growing uh, pretty, pretty quickly. This actually could be one box in a, in a uh, co-location center, uh, in a point of presence, a pop, or it might be a whole network, okay? It might, it might actually look like uh, one of these other networks and have a larger geographic extent. So I'm going to NANOG, the North American Network Operators Group, in two weeks. 
where all of these all of these IXPs will be there, and they'll be trying to get these networks to connect to their IXP. Okay, so some of them some of them make money, some of them are nonprofit. Yeah. So who owns IXPs? So some of them are cooperative agreements. Okay, it's cooperative endeavors. Some of them are for profit. I talked to one guy that he's the guy that runs a Chicago IXP, and then there's others uh, that have a you know that cover the whole southeastern U.S. That maybe it's a it's a collaborative between network providers. Okay, uh, so oh, software defined exchanges, uh, SDXs they use software defined network. So now in one minute, I need to tell you about the whole idea, economic SDXs. So the idea here is that these SDXs, uh, software-defined internet exchanges, provide a, a uh, low transaction cost, right? So that now transit providers can compete on a little bit more dynamic basis uh, with the ESDX functioning as a trusted third party to mediate the whole spot market. Okay. And they propagate offers of connectivity. The transit providers say, I can give transit for this price between these two ports. Uh, and the ESDXs propagate those and then uh, also propagate the acceptance of those and, and consummate the transaction. And also, along with that, handle the money flow. So just real quickly, here's one way it might work. Uh, the IXPs. W, X, and Y in this picture um, send out information about who they connect to, which this we're just going to look at connectivity between A and B. So they offer a price, and then there's an identifier, which is the letter K, and the price is 1, and the price is 3. So Delta and Gamma, which are transit networks, offer different prices to get to A. Those get propagated. Epsilon adds its price to the thing it got from Delta uh, and propagates that. So now B has uh, two offers. It decides to accept the one labeled NK and it indicates that to the, to the ESDX, which then sets up the routing state and that propagates back through the network. So that's the way it would work. Uh, that is roughly the way BGP works right now. There's an additional uh, pass through the network where the transaction has to be accepted. Second approach is where we add a broker to the picture and uh, the broker collects all the information about the offers and then propagates it back out and then once the offer is accepted it, that information goes to the broker and it tells the IXPs or the ESDXs to set up the forwarding state and the same thing happens. Okay. So uh, one of these is a lot like the way BGP works right now. Uh, each one has pluses and minuses, uh, which are to be investigated. Uh, there's different levels of transparency about what happens. Right now, the business relationships are the most uh, uh, shrouded in mystery aspect of the way the internet works right now. Nobody wants to reveal their business relationships. Some of this would be more transparent. So there's lots of work to be done on this. Um, what would be the unit of service? Is it a number of packets? Is it a number of bits? Is it some time-based thing? Um, what's the right unit to denominate this in? Uh, there's synchronization issues and uh, trust issues, and of course the problem of how you set the price. So, you know, this is just kind of a high-level idea um, to generalize the money flow. And what we'd like to do is provide some kind of market for transit and have the, the whole question about what's the transaction denominated in is we're looking for the equivalent of a, of a shipping container. So that's it. Other questions? Nathan. about um, consumer exposure to this variable ah, pricing right because I, in particular like how much of my monthly internet access fee is associated with the transit component? do you have any sort of guess at what that is or 
So that's a great <laughs> question, and I, I should have pointed that out, that the customers here are the access networks. It's not that you, as a consumer, uh, would actually be making these choices or seeing them, right? The idea is to put the mechanism in place to catalyze the innovation over time. Um, as far as how much of your monthly bill is, is transit, uh, I suspect the answer to that is less and less, because frankly, uh, the amount of transit has been decreasing as uh, Akamai builds out its network, as Google. So what's happened is the content providers are putting their content in the access networks, right? So more and more of traffic is you all watching video from Netflix or Amazon or whatever, they all have content distribution facilities, and their goal is to put that as close as possible to the access, access network, right? So that is tending to reduce the demand for transit. But there's always going to be some transit providers. Yes, we should maybe take it offline. Ask it. And One more question. Yeah. Um, how does this relate to, I haven't been following it very closely, but debates around net neutrality. Right. Yeah, that's a longer discussion. Give uh, a quick answer. Uh, well, I don't. It's not possible to answer almost any question about net neutrality quickly, okay? Because uh, it's a complicated subject. Sorry.